This is Ben Ingram from the Atlanta Braves Radio Network, and you're about to go riding with the Braves, presented by Chevrolet. See who else is joining us today. Riding with the Braves, we're with Tyler Magic today in a Chevy Silverado Trail Boss. Not a bad ride for us today, is it? No, it's a beautiful car. Real nice inside here. All right, let me go back to high school days with you. Because mm. you had a really good ball club. You got, it was you and Kyle Hendricks, right? Kyle Hendricks was my uh, high school teammate, yes. And so you guys, I mean, you, I'm sure you had lots of attention from a young age, I mean, with, with major league teams and scouts, and I'm sure, pretty sure at a young age you knew, I got a shot to do this. Yeah, I think it became real for me, um, let's see, probably like my junior year of high school. I remember one game, we, uh, you know, I'm from Southern California, so it's a big baseball mecca for, for youth baseball, and we had a game against Garrett Cole, who was going to be obviously an early first round draft pick that year. Um, I was a junior, he was a senior, I was able to pitch against him, a bunch of scouts showed up to see him, happened to see me as well, and that's where my, uh, you know, attention kind of came, and, and from that point on, I was uh, kind of on the radar to uh, possibly play Major League Baseball, so when that happened, I was I was really thinking of baseball as a, a possible thing for me in the future. So that moved pretty quick, because you go from junior year, and then you're drafted first round, what, mm-hmm. a, a year later? Yeah. Yeah, I moved pretty quick. My uh, sophomore year and junior year a little bit, like I got kind of sick. Just like an illness, lost a lot of weight, wasn't really playing ball that well. Mm-hmm. And then my body kind of grew back into my body, got a little bit of weight. That kind of, you know, got me back into where I was able to play baseball at a, at a higher level. Take us through everything that you went through once you got to the big leagues, because I've, I've read stories about it. But I want to hear in your words what the challenges were like and how you overcame some of those issues to get where you are now. Yeah, so I i mean, I had a little bit of uh, some hiccups when I first made it up. So I made it up in 2014 as a starter. It took me a little while to get through there. I had some times where I was actually just really wild and couldn't throw a lot of strikes. And that kind of kept me out of the big leagues for a while. Got that under control and made it to the big leagues in 2014. 2015, I then uh, got a case of the yips. For, you know, if you don't know what the yips are, it's I just basically couldn't throw very simple throws that I should be doing, mm-hmm. like muscle spasms in my arm where I'd go to release the ball and it just wouldn't go where I wanted it to. And uh, overcame that in 2015, 16, 17, didn't play. Overcame that in about 2017. I started playing again in AD ball 2018 and 2019 where the Braves saw me, mm-hmm. picked me up in 2019, and I was back with the team, with the Braves in uh, 2020. Alex kind of took a took a chance on me, picked up a, an older guy from Indie Ball, and, and put me on the opening day roster. So it was a, a wild, crazy uh, way to get back to the big leagues. Well, when you go to Indie Ball, it, and I'm sure you felt pretty confident, you just needed a spot. You just needed a place where somebody could see you. Without imagine you felt like if they can just see me, they're gonna they're gonna give me an opportunity. Yeah, I, I mean, the first year I just wanted to go play. I wanted to prove to myself that I could still play baseball after having the yips. Uh-huh. And then. Once I was out there playing in 2018, I started really like, hey, you know what? Like, I think I still got it. Like, I think I have an actual <laughs> chance of, you know, maybe making it back to the big leagues. You know, velo started to go up and everything, and then it became like, all right, well, you know, I've kind of got the yips in my rearview mirror. Let's let's see how far I can take this. Yeah. And uh, 2019, I was definitely thinking like, I just need somebody to come see me. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was. Um, you know, I was we were playing in the middle of nowhere a lot of those places, yeah. and for the Braves to send out scouts was, uh, you know, a testament to how good their their scouting department is. Well, it was so cool because let's go back to that spring training. You get your opportunity with the Braves, and, and I'm down there, and we're covering the team, and you're expecting, okay, you know, this guy in the bullpen is going to have this role, and so on and so forth. And then here you come, yeah. and we didn't really know much about you. It's just like this guy looks good every time he's out there, and you just shot right on through, and you get to the point where you say. He's undeniable. He's got to be on the squad. And I know that had to be a, a big moment for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I came into 2020 spring training, I still was just a minor league invite. wasn't on the big league roster. I wasn't on the 40-man roster. So a lot of times, you know, you got obligations with guys being on the 40-man, guys being on the 25. So there's a lot of paperwork that goes on behind it. Um, you know, I just wanted a shot. And so I went out there. I knew it was a long shot, and I just wanted to go out there and give it all I had mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, kind of force their hand of like, hey, man, we can't. We can't not make a move today. Right. So, kind of my, no regrets. Exactly. I just wanted to go out there and do my thing mm-hmm. and just have no regrets, give it all. And, uh, you know, it, it it was a weird year because then the COVID happened and spring training ended. And I was like, oh, well, you know, I don't know if, you know, this lasts a year, two years, three years, you know, it, I don't know how long this whole thing's going to last. Mm-hmm. Luckily, it only lasted a couple months and uh, was able to come out and 
Spring Training 2.0 and make the team. All right, let's go to the legendary moment of legendary moments. The first off is just, I think back on it, I still get chills thinking about that inning, what happened. We're calling the game, and you know, it's second, third, nobody out, 4-2. And Joe and I are talking about if he can just get through the inning with a game tied, you feel good about the situation. <laughs> Clearly, it went a lot better than that. Yeah. <laughs> but what's going through your mind because you got Pujols, Souza, Betts, and and were, were you thinking, hey, I got to go strike out the side, or is this just one guy at a time? Let's see what happens. I mean, we we had the game pretty much set up. We knew we had a two run lead starting that seventh inning, and we know okay, Luke's going out there seventh. That means I'm probably going to go out eighth, and we're going to have Will going out nine. Luke goes out there. And for whatever reason, man, the Dodgers have just – they had his number that mm-hmm. series. You yeah. Know? He, he was throwing balls six, eight inches above uh, above the zone, giving up home runs, and we're all like, ah, that shouldn't be happening. Right. Like, just things were happening that shouldn't be happening, and just for some reason it's – you know, that's the way baseball works. But I see my guy Luke out there struggling a little bit, and I'm like – they're like, hey, Matt, to get hot. We're going to need you. I was like, all right, well, let's do it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I see him struggling out there, and uh, I call my number to come in and, and help him out. Runner on second and third, I'm thinking – Look, I need just need to get this first out because right. doing that, we can do a lot of different things. We can walk the next guy. We can try and get a double play. We can do a whole bunch of stuff, but you got to get the first out. Right. And I had Pujols, felt really confident against Pujols, so just went out there, attacked him. Once I got two strikes on him, I'm sorry, I'm gonna get, a, I got to get a strike out here. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Once they brought up Souza, you know, we had a little meeting on the mound or just a little thought process. Hey, you know, just it's a power versus power. Go after and get him. Okay. So got second strike out there, and I'm like, all right, well, why stop there? You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, it was thought crossed my mind, like, hey, should I, should we walk him? Should we not? No, we're gonna go. Let's go after Betts. Yeah. And um, you know, I felt confident against him that whole series, and you know, I just wanted to go out there and be aggressive and throw, again, throw fastballs and try and uh, you know establish as I'm coming at you. We're not we're not pitching around you. Let's go. Just happened to work out and rest is history well we think back on that and i mean the seventh inning was incredible but you go back out for the eighth yeah and and continued to roll i mean that was one of the best stretches that that anybody had in the postseason and furthermore i I think on that moment in the seventh it it, looking back on it all was there an aspect of it where you felt like that moment gave the team what they needed not just to get through that series but through the World Series too, it's almost like you felt like this is this is all happening for this team after that moment. Yeah, we felt really confident as a team after that. You know, the Dodgers uh, were obviously a great team, and um, you know, I respected them to win the World Series, and they've you know they're always supposed to be at the top. So mm-hmm. when we beat them, we knew we had a very good chance. Uh, we walked into the World Series, you know, feeling really confident. Um, I don't know if it was that one particular moment. I think it was just everything was clicking. Rick yeah. Rosario was clicking. The whole offense was clicking. Our starting rotation was clicking. Everything was clicking. Um, you know, and I was just happy that in that one moment I was able to help the team, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and get to the next level. But once we walked in the World Series, we were feeling really good, real confident. When you struck out Mookie Betts, is that the most fired up you've ever been on a baseball field? Absolutely. <laughs> like, I, 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 the crowd was so loud. I was so just excited that kind of like blacked out and then I do that like spinning twirl excitement <laughs> fist pump whatever you want to call it but I don't even remember that man I just remember then I was like once I got into the dugout I was like all right now you can calm back down yeah you're probably gonna go out for the eighth right you don't want to lose all your adrenaline in the seventh inning calm back down so I calmed back down and then uh turned it right back on right when I got back out the field. you go to the world series and you know you mentioned you're very confident and all that but there's still that moment of we're here we got through LA we're here I'd, I'd imagine there's some teams that think, well, I'm just happy to be here. Not you guys. I mean, it, you come out and handle business game one. Uh, take us through some of the moments that really stand out in your mind about the World Series that, that you'll never forget. I, I think that the pitching performances by the starters were unbelievable. Mm-hmm. For guys like Kyle Wright, Ian Anderson, um, you know, Freed, Morton, they all came out and they did amazing as starters. And when you have good starters that can come out and set the tone like that, Everything just falls into place. It takes the pressure off of the offense to score runs. It takes the pressure off of the, the bullpen to hold the close game, right. stuff like that. You know, it's just when the starters can go out and establish, you know, what we're going to do for that day and that game, it, it just puts everybody else at ease, puts the coaching staff at ease. It's just that's the way uh, winning teams go out there and win, win games like that. Well, you do it last year, and then you come into this season, and, and it's such a confident bunch because of what you did accomplish last year. 
and being around 500 or under 500 for the first two months of the season, I haven't seen any panic. And then the team wins 14 in a row. They know that you're going to be coming back healthy and uh, Kirby Yates later in the season, maybe even Mike, uh, Eddie. It's a team that I'm sure feels like the expectation and the standard is to be right back there once we get to October again this year. Absolutely. You know, we play 162 games, so the mindset is never panic. You know, mm-hmm. there's plenty of time left in the season. Uh, you just make it to the end of the postseason and anything can kind of happen. Our goal is to go out there and win the East, obviously. That's what we want to do. That's what we think we can do, and that's what we're, we're all trying to do. Um, but once you just get to the playoffs, anything can happen. So you can't panic in the first two months. You know, everybody likes to pay attention and look at the first two months as if it's the whole season. We play 162 for a reason because statistically things are going to balance out. The cream rises to the top after mm-hmm. that. Parade last year, you almost get put in handcuffs. Yeah. <laughs> what a crazy moment that was. Yeah, it was, you know, I, I'm not going to lie, I had a few adult sodas. So, uh, <laughs> I think we all did that too. Yeah, it was, you know, celebrating. And, um, you know, I saw the fans, they were all having a great time, and everybody just had such good energy, you know, down there on the street level. And I'm just like, you know, I'm on this bus. I want to get down and go hang out with the fans. Right, right. So I hopped off, was giving some high fives, and uh, I think the officer just didn't see me get off. He thought I was a random fan that had, like, swooped behind the bus. And he was just trying to keep everybody safe and protected. You know, the fans starting to kind of creep towards the bus and stuff. So I understood what he was doing. He just wanted that to stop and everybody to be safe. Uh, You know, I think that was the only incident that really happened in the the parade. So, you know, it's my fault. I shouldn't have gotten (laughs) off the bus. But the officer was just doing his job. And, uh, you know, if that's the worst thing that happens, that's the worst thing. Exactly. Great story. Great stories all together. And as always, thanks so much for taking the time with us today, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Got it.